Thank you so much for joining us online. Connect Fellowship Church exists to see people change their family tree. We would love to hear about what God is doing in your life. You can tell us at connectfellowship.church forward slash contact. You can also connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. For locations and service times, visit connectfellowship.church. If you would like to be a part of what God is doing at Connect by giving, visit connectfellowship.church forward slash give. We hope you enjoy this message and have a great day. Church, even though we're not at church, we're in church right now. We are in a position right now in a time of day where we get to be together, but we're not actually together. And that's a, that I know it can be scary. I know it can be saying, hey, I want to have this. I want to be together. But right now you get to watch this live. And so in your living room, I might be in your kitchen. I might be while you're driving. I don't know. But I do know this, that we are connected. That's why our church is called Connect Fellowship Church, because we are purposely connected together. And so we are going to get into this series. Let's get into this series, Peacemaker. Peacemaker is a perfect time, perfect place. Back in November, God had placed this message series in my heart. It's something that I was being challenged by is my peace in my own life. And God brought me to Scripture, and he brought me to chapters of the Bible that I just soaked on, and I, I read them, I observed them, I applied them, I prayed about them, I, I see God on them. And today, I kind of want to dig into one of those chapters that really are deep in my heart for you. But week one, if you missed it, you can go and, and download that and check it out on our app. You can go to week one so and check that out. Uh, maybe you're on YouTube, we're on Instagram, we're on Facebook Live, we're on Church Line uh, platform. So we just want to thank all you guys for being part of that. Well, let's get into this. Week one, we talked about in Peacemaker, don't tolerate that spirit. Hopefully you got a lot out of this one. And last week was a big deal because we had so many people actually reach back out to us saying thank you for the message. And the title of last week's message was why are we so anxious? What a perfect time. Well, today I want to get into moving us from the anxiousness and moving us from being tormented by a spirit and going into what our minds need to focus on as we are stuck in the ways of routines. Today, the title of today's message is what you focus on, you move towards. I tell my kids this all the time. Whatever you focus on, whatever your thought process is, you move towards it. it it's just, it's a habit. It's what we do. And so today I want to bring this you into the passage in the book of Colossians chapter 3. What a great book. If you never read Colossians, go ahead and read it. Paul is speaking to the church. And at this time, I know with the, us, with the coronavirus and us have to be inside together, we got to stay away from everyone. We could go to the store and come back home. Some of us are working, some of us are not working. And what happened at this time, the kids at home and they have school at home, is that our daily routine has been changed, hasn't it? Can I get an amen? When we get up has changed. Maybe you don't you sleep in later and you don't really want to, but you do. Maybe you're getting up way too early. Where you eat lunch at has changed. There's no more Chick-fil-A. You know Jesus is coming back. You can't go eat at Chick-fil-A. Your dinner has changed. Maybe your eating time has changed with the family. And some of our diets have messed up since the beginning of the year. And you go, you're eating, you're stress eating. You're eating chips all day. You have a bag of chips next to you. You get a little stressed, you start to eat chips. Maybe, maybe your routines are, are all messed up. Maybe you have all these routines in that you're so used to that's being uh, affected in your life. It's affecting your life on how you actually can think. You know, a lot of our, our routines with God has changed. And that's what I want to dig into today. Because I really believe people routine God. They come on Sunday is their day that they can get connected with God. They come with people. We worship. We do these things together. We, that, that's, my, that's my checklist. I, I, I get connected to God at church. And now you can't do that coming live at church that your routine's messed up and you feel like you're further away from God. And maybe you follow God on a checklist of your routine. Maybe, maybe you're following God throughout the day of a checklist of a routine and you say prayer check, feed the homeless check, I get part of a small group, which you can, on our Zoom groups, check. And these routines are really good, and you should have a routine following God. Maybe you, you, you put it in a list of God every day that 
that you're going to pray, that you're going to spend time with them, you're going to do these things. But if it becomes a checklist, that that's all you do so you can move on and never think about God again, that these routines are good, but Paul says they can hurt you. Colossians chapter 2, we're going to dig in chapter 3, but I want us to go at the end of chapter 2 because it's going to pick up in verse 1 in chapter 3. And I want you to hear Paul talking about these routines of following God, how they can affect you. They're good, but they can actually hurt you if they just become a routine in your life and not part of your life. God should never be what you do. It is who you are. Following God is who I am. I don't have to think about it. It's something I do. It's natural to me because I force myself knowing that God is the most important thing in my life. And then God is not a routine in my life. God is my life. And so I want you to, I want, I want you to hear this as you have a lot of downtime maybe and you're not as busy as you used to be so you don't have to think about it. Now you're thinking too much and you're wondering if I'm even connected to God. Do I even know how to follow God? Well, listen to what Paul says about this in verse Chapter 2, verse 20, Colossians, says this. You have died with Christ, and he has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world. That you are set free. If you are a believer, you've given your life to Jesus, and Jesus has set you free from the world. He, he removed all that and put it on the cross so you and I can have a relationship with the Father. He says this. So why do you keep on following the rules of the world such as... Don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. Checklists, checklists, checklists. Such rules are mere human teachings about things that deteriorates as we use them. And these rules may seem wise because they require such strong devotion, pious self-denial, severe bodily discipline. Those are good things. Like you, you're, you're, maybe you're working out every day and you have these routines that you check off so you can mentally just shut down, but that's not good in your spiritual life. You should never routine God to a point to where it's just a checklist. That it's what you do, but it's not just a checklist. Does everybody understand this? Listen to the last verse in chapter 20, and we're going to dig right into chapter, I mean, in chapter 2, we're going to dig right into chapter 3 because it, it, it goes into this. Listen to what Paul says at the end. He said, it's great that you have all these things, but they're merely worldly things. Checklists, all the things following God I'm talking about. He said, but they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. That you're still living out of the flesh, that it's not going to help you get connected to God. It's not going to help you eliminate what is bothering you in the inside of the anxiousness of the tormenting spirits of all these things that the worry the stress the wondering the whatever i i don't know how to follow god i i i need church i need people and you, you you're panicking and paul's saying hey hey watch this let me let me let me explain to you in chapter three that's going to help you stay free today this is what he says chapter three verse one if then, so remember, he says, but they provide no help in conquering a person's evil, evil desires. If then you have been raised, so now he wants to remind you of who you are in Christ and what God has placed in you and the power that you have to overcome all these things. If then you have been raised. What does he mean that if then you have been raised? Remember, when you gave your life to Jesus, remember Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He was born, he was buried. In three days, he rose again. He overcame the death, he overcame the sin in the world, and he overcame everything so you and I can be set free. He says, so you've been raised. Remember, tell yourself, you've been raised. I've been raised. I've been raised from the dead. I was born again. When I've given Jesus my life, my personal life, my personal life, I've given it over to him that I'm a new creation, I'm a born again. He says, so you've been raised. Know that. He says, with, with Christ, with Christ. There's a big deal there because that Greek word, that, that with right there is a special with. When he talks about this in the Bible, he says that you are anointed, that, that Jesus anointed you 
with his power, with Christ. As you were born again, I want you to hear this, as you were born again, that you are anointed with Christ. That you're anointed. That, you, that, 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 that Christ called you and he anointed you. He put his power on you. And he says, do this. I need you to do this every day. I need you to seek the things that are above. This is Paul's answer to our routine. This is Paul's answer. He says, I need you to seek the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things on the earth. I know we have tons of things going on right now. The news, Facebook, Instagram, all these things constantly in people's lives. No, 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 no. I'm telling you, make this who you are. Make this, he says, to seek. Let me tell you what this word seek means. It means to desire. Now, watch this. If you're going to keep your, 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 what you focus on and move towards, think about this. Here's a, here's a people, p- piece of paper here. And what happens is, is that there's this dot. See this dot right there? Stay focused on the dot. Stay focused on it. Don't, don't keep your eye off of it. What do you see? You see a dot, don't you? A black dot. Yeah. Yeah. And the further and further you get, you still see it, don't you? Yeah, no matter where it goes, you still see the dot, don't you? Yeah, of course you do. Why? Because you're desiring it. You're seeking it. You're looking for it. You're, you're, your eyes are focused. And, and when you focus on the dot, you see the dot. You don't see everything around me. You don't even see the background, do you? You don't see much. All you see is that black dot. And if you stay focused on the black dot, you stay there focused long enough, you will actually see visions. You'll actually see things in the dot. You'll see things around you, you, your, your, your pinpoint focus. And that's what Christ is saying here. Paul's saying, hey, desire the things that are above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not the things that are on earth. Verse 3, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When you've given your life to Jesus, and if you're watching this and you haven't, we're going to give you that opportunity before we leave today. But if you've given your life to Jesus, what happens is your old self dies, and you're born again with a new life, a new creation. You can do this. I don't care how you were raised as a Christian. Know this. Paul's saying, hey. Desire, seek, focused on him and him alone. Don't worry about what the world says. He says, when Christ, who is your life, appears, right, focused on Christ, when Christ's life appears in you, then you also will appear with him in glory. You're going to shine. Now, if you don't do that, you keep your eyes focused on what's around you of the earth and, and your, your, your checklist of God, and you go, okay, I'm done. I'll put him to the side, and I'll put that over there, and i never worry about it again until my checklist comes back. Listen to what happens in Romans chapter 8, verse 5 through 9. Listen to what Paul says. Those who are dominated by their sinful nature, which is thinking about all the world stuff all the time and not focusing on and seeking God, the desire of Jesus, that knowing that he has given you the freedom to live without the worry, without the anxiousness, those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about the things that pleases the Spirit. That's going to help you stay out of trouble while you're idle right now. Because if you're so focused on earthly things, your desires of your sinful nature will push towards those. You'll start lusting. Maybe you're looking at websites you shouldn't. Maybe you're spending too much money right now when you're supposed to be saving. Maybe you're not getting in small groups. Maybe maybe you're just just separating yourself from your family because you're depressed. He says, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about the things that pleases the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your minds leads to death. But letting the spirit control your mind leads to life and listen to peace. It's a big deal here. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's law anyway, and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. But 
You are not controlled by the simple nature, Christian. You're not. You might be pulled by it, but you're not controlled by it. Why? You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of the living God, of the Spirit of God living in you. You are in full control. Whatever you focus on, you will move towards. You focus on the simple desires, you will move that way. But know this, that you have a spirit that's in you, Christian, that is in you, that is in control. But you have to get out the way and allow it to flow through you. God wants to speak to you. He wants to to show you himself. Maybe you don't have that, that understanding yet, but God wants to give you that. Paul goes on right after verse 4. He goes on through verse 5 through 10, which we won't dig into today in chapter 3, saying, I'm going to kind of paraphrase this. He's saying this, hey, you, you, if, if you, to live this, this Christian life out as a believer in Jesus, a following Jesus, you, you, to get this fullness of God in your life, you have to put to death these earthly things that you're so used to, these routines that cause you away from God. And Paul makes a list inside of it. Go read it after this message. Go dig into chapter 3. And, and here's some of the things that Paul says, hey, lust, get rid of it. If you want to stay focused on those things, what you got to get rid of the lust. And I'm not talking about just sexual lust. I'm talking about lust on, on things on TV or, or just, just these routines that force you away from God. And he says, also, doing whatever you feel like doing, no, you can't. If it ain't right, and if it's not right with God, then stop it. If your life is shaped by your feelings instead of what God wants, then you have an issue. If you need to feel God versus being with God, there's a problem. There's a huge problem. You, you, you cannot live your Christian walk with feelings. You cannot just feel your way to heaven. You got to walk in your walk with God by faith and believe and know. So here in Colossians chapter three, verse twelve through seventeen, we're going to finish this this message up through these scriptures here, and we're given a, a Paul's given us a clear instructions on what a new person in Christ even looks like, and we're told how to live this new life in Christ, and 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 what that restored life looks like. Maybe you don't know. Maybe you've been out of church. You've been out of a connection with other believers. And maybe you're at home and maybe half your family is not a believer. And you're trying to live this life. But God, know this, that the new life in Christ. And he wants to restore your life. And, he, and Paul says, hey, I'm going to show you what it looks like. A certain and undeniable change should have taken place. Man, I'm telling you, when I give my life to Christ, the first thing I did, I quit drinking. Alcohol. I just knew. And let me tell you, Christian, if you're drinking right now and it's becoming a bad habit because you feel like you're stressed and you're going to get liquor and you're going to do these things, I know, look, hey, I know it's not a sin to drink. I totally understand. You don't, uh, listen, I'm not trying to condemn you. Well, I am saying this, if that's your way out of things and not, not, not seeking Jesus, there's an issue there. Because there's an undeniable change should be taking place when you're following Christ. It will lead you to Become the righteous person that God's called you to become, not the person that who you were. Remember, you were born again. You were set apart. You were, you were pulled closer to Jesus, not closer to the world. So maybe instead of going shopping at the grocery store, buy something different. When you go to think about, hey, I'm going to just get that one more bottle of wine because it relaxes me. Hey, you know what? I'm going to drink water that day. Maybe, maybe, maybe you need to check your spirit right now. I'm telling you. It's becoming a habit. Why are the liquor stores still open? I don't know. But they are. Why? Because they know people are going to buy it. Because it's a way out. And let me tell you, Christian, you're so much above that. You're so much above the way out is that. You're so much above that. God is so bigger than that. God is so much more to us than that. And when we read and study this passage in chapter 3, we need to remember that the Bible is not a book about people. It's not. We need to remember that the, that, that the Bible is about God and his dealings with his people. In this case, God dealing with us as his people. 
So as we examine this text, and let, let us remember that God is always a proactive God. God is always working something out. Like, you don't think God is working something out through this coronavirus? He is. He's working it out. He's working it out. The church is going to expand like it's never expanded. People are going to come know who Jesus is through this time period. He, 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 I'm telling you, God is a proactive God. And he takes the initiative and, 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 and he took the initiative in our creation. He took the initiative in our salvation. He takes the initiative in our sanctification. God always takes the initiative. Then he calls upon us to respond appropriately, to live it out, to, to, to be obedient. Notice that we're going to dig into five areas where he has taken the initiative to restore us back to him. And Paul is explaining this to the, to the church and, and, and the response he expects from us as those who have been restored to follow him are these five areas. This is what he expects from us. This is what he wants us to see. This is what, what God wants you and I to see. This is Paul saying, hey, I'm glad you got the routines, but don't let them bring you into the world. Hey, I know you have worldly routines. Cut those out and focus on the spirit. Because whatever you focus on, you'll move towards. Okay? Are we in that period right now? This is where we're at right now. I know I talked about it. We just went in. Paul's saying, hey, church, okay, I need you to get your mind back focused on what's important. And that's the Father God. And let me tell you why that's important. Let me tell you why. And here's five areas he tells us why. Here's number one. You're taking notes. Because he chose us. That's why. So we can enjoy the favor of God. Verse 12 tells us, since God chose you to be the holy people he loves. He chose you. Your salvation was not by accident. You becoming a believer in Jesus is not by chance. God chose you. He chooses every person to come know his son, Jesus Christ. You accepted it, but he chose you. And when he chose you, there's a, there's a favor of that. That's, that's the, the favor of God. I look back at my life of my salvation. I should not be saved. I was an atheist that denied Christianity for so long in my younger years. All the way till I was 26 years of age. I, I literally, literally hated Christianity. But that one day that God still had his hands on me and, and seek me out. And he put people to witness to me. And he told people to come talk to me. And I would, I would lash back at them. But eventually there was always that one. Those seeds were planted and my life started to change. And I started to seek something that I didn't know what was there. And all along it was Jesus saying, hey, I love you. I chose you. You got to know that. You're chosen. If you are a believer and you know Jesus, you are a chosen person by God. And get to enjoy his favor. Here's number two. The second part of verse 12. But number two says this, because number one was because he chose us. Number two, because he changed us. And because he changed us, we love the people of God. Maybe you never liked people at the time. I didn't either. If I could be by myself, I was cool. But when I came to know who Jesus was, it was something that lived inside of me that, that taught me how to love other people above myself. There was something there. Listen to verse 12. Verse 12 says, since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourself with a tenant heart of mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness. Patience. Make allowance for each other's faults. Don't we need to do that now? Being with our family 24 hours a day, all day long, we got to make a lot of allowance. We got to give a lot of allowance out these big days right now. We do. People are panicking. 
When you go to the store, make sure you have a lot, a lot, a lot of allowance in your pocket. You got, I call it change in your pocket. It's like every time someone cuts you off, every time I get snotty with you, every time when someone cuts your basket off at the store or wherever you're shopping, wherever, even at work, you have people un, not, not being happy and the bosses being mad, say bring a big pocket of change and leave it in your pocket. And every time someone gets on, the your nerve, on your nerve, take one quarter out or one penny out of one pocket and put it in the other. So, okay, I'm, I'm going to focus on this full pocket here. you got to give allowance. And it says to forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe, remember that, above all, clothe yourself with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. Remember, God chose us. And he changed us. We need to see that change. You need to look at yourself and say, okay, the change is happening. You might not like it all the time because I'm getting used to this, but the change is happening. Here's number three. He chose us. He changed us. Number three, because he called us. We participate because he called us. We get to participate in the peace of God. There's something about that. Verse 15 says this, and let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. That was a scripture in November. I was getting surgery. My wife just had surgery. Things were changing. I was, I was just going through some times. The holidays were happening. Just a lot going on. And I was seeking God. I didn't have no peace in my life. And God says, hey, I need you to seek this word peace. You need peace. And this scripture was one of the first scriptures I read. And it says, and let the peace of God that comes, let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your heart. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. And God had ministered to me there. And when he said that in that scripture, I just, I, I, I just was so in awe and so, so, I say convicted. I was just repenting. I'm like, God, forgive me. You have called to, my heart should be peaceful. He called us. Because he called us, this word translated called, because this word, he says, you are called to live in peace. You are called. Let me tell you what this word called means. I looked it up, and I'm like, okay, I'm called to live in peace, which means to summon or call your name as if you've been summoned to court at the table of the king. This imagery here is that God has called us out of the world to live in his eternal presence, that you are at his table. And in his presence, there is peace. There's no fighting between his people. And the Christians should should picture themselves in the presence of God and where his holiness is at and and his mighty and his splendor and his glory and, and where it is on display all the time in us. When we start to get anxious and we start to get worried through this time and this crisis, we need to sit ourselves at the feet of Jesus. We need to sit ourselves at the table of God and know if we are were in front of the Lord himself watching us, how would we react to the situation we're currently in? Remember, God is everywhere. He's always with us. He's omnipotent. Omnipresent. Wherever your heart's at, he's with you. Remember, the Spirit of God's in us. He's not over there. He's in us. If you're a believer, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit lives in you. He's with us at all times. He's never going to control you, but he wants control over you. He wants to lead through you. He wants to give you his peace. He wants to give you all the, the, what he has. He wants to give you all things. Because the peace of God mentioned in here is not the indwelling feeling of comfort. It's not where you're going to feel these tangles and go, oh, my God, I feel so happy. No, it's not that, but rather it's an external reality that meditates between Christians. When you become with two people and you're, you're talking about God, it's amazing. That's why you need to be part of small groups. It's amazing what God does. He gives you this sense of peace. And what Paul is saying here is that the peace of God should govern our hearts. It should have control of us and power over our hearts to the end that we're one in him. 
And don't misunderstand me. There's a right way and a wrong way to have peace. The wrong way is to leave sin unchecked. To compromise the truth for the sake of unity. You don't just go do something for someone because it's going to make them happy. Sometimes you've got to speak truth in other people's lives. And maybe your kids. Maybe you're trying to buy them things so they'll be quiet and they're happy and you don't want them all upset about this coronavirus and all these things going on and it's unsafe. No, the only peace that you can give them is the word of God. You can't buy them a Switch. You can't buy them a PS4. You can't buy them enough games. You can't give them money. You can't buy them enough food. That's going to give them peace. It might, it might fill them for a short while, but eventually it's going to overtake them. Remember, it will overtake them. But because we are called into the presence, we're allowed in his peace. And when his peace comes over us, we're right with God. Here's number four. Because he counsels us. We build up the family of God. Verse 16 says, let the message about Christ and all its riches fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful heart. If you go to get with God and your mind's so unfocused and all over the place, man, put on some worship music. Put on your favorite worship music and just sing out to the Lord. Give him a y'all. Kneel down and sing. Right before we were getting up here this morning, we, we put on worship. We, we like, you know, uh, like we were having church. And I'm just in awe over God. I'm, I'm, my hands are held high. I'm just, I'm just worshiping the Father. And, and it's just me and him. And this peace that just comes over you is just, it keeps you focused. Whatever you focus on, you move towards. Here's the last one. The last one. Because he cares for you. Because he cares for you. Remember, because he chose us, he changes us. He calls us. He counsels us. And the last one, because he cares for us. And we, we know that the Father cares for us. We cherish the name of God. Verse 17, the last verse. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. You know, I know as we're longing for this peace, there's some of us watching today that you're like, I don't even know if I know Jesus. been away from God, I've been all over the place. I'm going to give you that opportunity right now to know him. And to get to know Jesus, all you have to do is believe by faith that he's the son of God. He died on the cross, rose again, and his blood washed away our sins. And as I pray, I want you to pray. I want you to make sure that you take this opportunity to get right with him. Remember, God cares for you. He loves you. I, I don't care how far you've been off to the left or to the right. Come back, focus in the middle, and move towards him. Let's pray. Father, every person that's watching right now, you're with them. You're in their hearts. You're nudging some of them. Father God, as each person prays, that they repeat this prayer after me, Father. Lord, forgive me of all my sins. And I believe in your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for me, who saved me, 
that his blood was shed for me. I make him Lord over my life, and I give you my life today. In Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, amen. Come on, let's give Jesus some praise today. If you made that decision today, or maybe you rededicated your life back to him. And if you're on church platform, check off for us. Put it on Facebook or email us at info at connectfellowship.church. Tell us your story. We want to know. We do. We want you to start your pathway to discipleship. Let us know about that. Amen? Amen? Amen. Well, look, hey, here's what's going on. Let me give you a few things of what's happening here at Connect. Don't forget... If you're interested in small groups, email us at info at connectfellowship.church or you can message us on Facebook, Connect page. Uh, you, can, you can do it that way. We will give you information about joining our small groups. If you're a member of our church, we know that you got an email to get involved on that. If you don't know how to do that, we use what we call Zoom. Go to Zoom, download the app, or go on your computer uh, and, and get on. It's an easy way to doing it. We you do it. I'm telling you, get check check it off and let us know. We have a men's group uh, on on Mondays and a ladies group. I think on Fridays we'll give you more information. Be all over our, our website, our Facebook page, all that. You can get involved in there. And uh, and let's not forget, we're going to collect tithes and offerings today. Remember that we're still running a church. And remember, your tithe is still sacred to God. Regardless if you're here in person or not, the Bible still says to bring your tithe to the storehouse. And here's how you can bring it. You can download the app, and you can give that way. Or you can go to our website, connectfellowship.church, give that way. Or you can mail a check to us or cash, whatever how you want to do that. You can mail it to 15521 Oak Lane, Gulfport, Mississippi. 39532. Make it simple, make it easy, but remember, your tithe is brought to the storehouse. And as you give your tithe, know this, that we are advancing the kingdom. We're live today because of you. We're still supporting missionaries. We're still giving to church planners. We're still giving to uh, one of our networks, Next Level Relational Network, which we were on a call with 87 lead pastors ministering through this crisis. Some of them lost their churches because they met in schools. And they can't even have church. They don't even know how to set up live. We are we're giving towards that, guys. We're still giving our way. And we're going to advance the kingdom because of you and your tithe. We get to spread the gospel to the world. So thank you for that. Before I leave today, I'm going to pray over those, those tithes and those offerings, and I'm going to pray. Make sure you give today. You can give, any, if, even if you're not a member of our church, you don't have a church, and you say, hey, you know what, I need to give, make sure you do that today. Download our app, Connect Fellowship Church, on the App Store. Go to our website, connectfellowship.church. Well, let's pray. Father, Lord, we just thank you for the service. We thank you for the impact that it's going to have over people's lives and your words speaking to each one of us. We thank you for each person that gives to the vision that connect, who brings their tithe to the storehouse because they love you with a cheerful heart, Father. We give you praise for that. We give you glory. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody said amen. See you later, guys. Love you. Can't wait to connect with you.